When you hear the name Godzilla, what's the first phrase that pops into your head? For me, it's... Hey, you wanna see something cool? For me, Godzilla is the big cool monster that blows stuff up and has a pretty sweet game on the GameCube. For others, it could be the more subtle aspects of the monster, looking past all the destruction and looking at what Godzilla represents for the people of Japan. And also a big cool monster that blows stuff up. With the recent release of Godzilla x Kong, I can see that the general consensus is that while the actual monster stuff is cool, the rest of the movie is seven flavors of ass. Yet, when compared to the Japanese version of The King of Monsters, with movies like Shin Godzilla and Godzilla Minus One, people are saying it's some of the best monster movies ever made. So what makes Japan's Godzilla so great? Is it really as simple as having the power of God and anime on your side? Could it be that Japan has been making movies about Godzilla for so long they just know what works and what doesn't work? Maybe not. Well, after watching them back to back, I think I figured out what the issue is. The human characters. So the main appeal of a giant monster movie is the giant monster. Well, duh. Look, that much is obvious. However, the problem is you can't focus on the monster the entire time. Hell, even most of the time. Even if the movie is named after them, and they're plastered all over the promotional material, they're usually only in like 20% of any given movie. They can't speak. They are enormous creatures with no means of verbal communication. Well, except for that one guy. So what do you do? You must introduce human characters to drive the plot forward for the remaining 80%. You see the issue with this, right? That's not what the audience cares about. The problem is, human characters have no chance of truly, earnestly being able to interact with these monsters in any meaningful way. They're animals. They're animals! Like forces of nature. You aren't gonna get a scene of Millie Bobby Brown talking to Godzilla and Godzilla responds to her. Because of this, there almost needs to be a movie within a movie. Human characters, outside of wojacking when there's a monster attacking, have their own shit going on. Their plot is almost completely separate from the giant monsters. And I think this is ultimately where Western Godzilla movies tend to fall flat on their face. With all of that being said, I'd like to take a look at the two most recent Godzilla movies, Godzilla x Kong on Team USA and Godzilla Minus One on Team Japan. There will be four main categories we will be comparing between each movie, and we can find out exactly what each movie does better than the other. So, without further ado, let them fight. A movie is nothing without its leading characters driving the story forward, except in Godzilla x Kong's case where they're more like the annoying passengers you have to deal with while you wait to get to the real destination. Want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? As I said in my previous video, this movie is definitely more Kong's story than anything else, so when the focus is on him, the movie's engaging. However, since Kong can't speak, and you need someone to explain what's going on, that's where the humans come into play. But it's not their story. Nothing they do has any feeling of progress. They kind of just react to things around them while adding no value themselves. Whoa! That thing is massive! So, quick the rundown of the human cast. We have CEO Girl Boss Mother, her adopted deaf daughter from Skull Island, the conspiracy podcaster from the last movie, and an eccentric vet that is basically diet Chris Pratt. None of these characters are particularly interesting and none of their motivations are really all that compelling either. CEO Girl Boss Mom just wants to figure out what's causing those weird signals and to help her daughter find a place to belong, and also to sell you a car. God damn, look at that product placement. Deaf Girl just wants to help King Kong and also hates being in normal society instead of back on Skull Island. You know, Skull Island where they have this f***ing thing instead of air conditioning and internet. The conspiracy theorist wants fame and notoriety and more proof about Hollow Earth. He also wants to know if he can say it this time. Do I get to say it? Please tell me that I can say it. Say it. it. You're grounded! What? Oh yeah! For how long? A month! Dad. The vet guy just wants to like help the animals, man, and like send chill vibes and stuff, you know bro? He also just kind of gives off this certain vibe with the CEO mom, like, uh... How do I describe this with subtlety? Let me in, I'm trying to fuck! The most they wind up doing to serve the greater plot is giving Kong his robot arm upgrade and summoning Mothra because the deaf girl happens to be the Lisa on Al-Gaib. 
Listen, I gave. Seriously, this one random deaf girl is like the chosen one, and she's able to bring forth Mothra like a Yu-Gi-Oh monster. And for Kong's robot arm, you want to talk plot contrivances? There are about a billion things that need to line up perfectly in order for Kong to successfully get this thing. Outside of those two things, if you took the human characters out of the movie, the movie wouldn't really change all that much. That's how little of an impact they had. I get that they're a necessary evil so the cool thing can happen, but they're just so boring. None of the main cast are very likable or very funny, and none of them have an interesting story to tell, so their scenes just feel so much longer. Now let's take a hop, skip, and jump over to the east and start examining how Godzilla Minus One handled its human characters. The movie takes place at the tail end of World War II, 1945, when Japan was close to, if not already, about to surrender to the Allies, especially after the whole... you know. No, no, this can't be. My le bomb! It kills people! So our main character is named Koichi, a kamikaze pilot that lands on Odo Island. Odo Island is an air service base that primarily repairs Japanese fighter planes. He claims that there's a malfunction with his plane and stopped by to get it fixed. The head mechanic gives it a look and realizes there's nothing wrong with Koichi's plane and figures out he was attempting to abandon his duty. Because not only did he fear for his life, but he also saw it as pointless because the war was as good as lost anyway. Damn! Right away, in the first few minutes of the movie, it is infinitely more compelling than anything Godzilla x Kong has done. You instantly know what this character is going through. You see the struggle between self-preservation and duty, you see the attitude that Japan had to its soldiers and to life in general, you see the domino effect that will one day lead to anime, the worst thing that has ever happened. All of that in the first five minutes of the movie, a masterclass in storytelling. And that's before Godzilla even shows up. Speaking of, Godzilla starts off as a big T-Rex thing. He's not the nuclear disaster that you know and love. Yet. The mechanics are running scared and the lead mechanic, his name is Tachibana, tells Koichi to shoot Godzilla with his plane's gun, since he's the only trained fighter pilot there and the rest of them are just the mechanics. Koichi gets to the plane, but he chickens out at the last second. You're not good, you, you're just a chicken. Chip, 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 chip. And instead he runs and hides. This leads to the mechanics panicking and ultimately getting them all killed besides Tachibana. Tachibana then rebukes Koichi and blames him for their deaths, piling on even more guilt and shame. This starts Koichi on his journey for the rest of the movie. Outside of Koichi and Tachibana, there are some other characters including Noriko, a woman that Koichi begins a relationship with that also happened to have an orphan baby she rescued, and the crewmates on his new job as a minesweeper. Each of these characters are interesting in their own right, each with their own issues and character arcs to overcome. I could go into more details, but it's pretty much overkill at this point. There is an overwhelming difference in quality between Godzilla x Kong and Godzilla Minus One's human characters. It might as well be the hydrogen bomb versus coughing baby meme. Minus One's human plot is so good, if you were to completely take Godzilla out of the movie, it would still be a really good movie, and that's saying something. But what good is a Godzilla movie without Godzilla? Well, it turns out you don't have to wonder because Godzilla is only in the new empire for eight minutes? This motherfucker is barely in this thing. But to be fair, he does make his time count. Can't look at Randy Orton slithering. Oh, watch, like out, watch, out, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out! But yeah, outside of his beef with Kong and the final battle, Godzilla is basically a side character in his own movie. His whole thing is being the king of monsters, so if any other kaiju tries to start some shit, Godzilla wakes up and beats it like it owes him money. The rest of the time, Godzilla is just sleeping in the Roman Colosseum and minding his own business. Now, let's compare this to Godzilla Minus One. In this movie, Godzilla is absolutely the primary antagonist with no other monsters to share the spotlight with. Godzilla is a malicious force that loves to destroy humans for no reason, outside of the, you know. My bomb. Like Both Godzillas are really intimidating and cool, but I think what really sets Minus One's Godzilla apart is his atomic breath. Most of the time, Godzilla's atomic breath is like a super powerful flamethrower or laser beam. However, in Minus One, Godzilla's beam is more like a railgun that slowly builds up power and releases all at once in one quick burst. It causes an enormous atomic explosion. Buildings get blown away in an instant and so many people were just two days away from retirement. It seems so obvious, right? Like the monster that's supposed to be the representation of nuclear destruction can fire off nukes at will? 
absolute slam dunk of an idea. Speaking of, the scene that immediately follows the atomic breath is my favorite part of the movie. As the dust settles, Koichi comes stumbling out of Plot Armor Alley, which he was pushed into by his now super dead wife. Once the shock has worn off, he lets out a haunting scream as black rain begins to fall down. <laughs> Jesus, man. That shit is crazy. Frog. Man, is there anything that even comes close to that level of intensity in Godzilla x Kong? Uh, wait, hang on, I found something. Ah, there we go. Okay, never mind. F minus one, this scene's way better. I am of the opinion that characters should grow and learn throughout a movie. If they end it the same way they began, what was even the point? So how do Godzilla x Kong's characters wind up at the end? Take a wild guess. Okay, but let's be fair and let's give them an honest look. The conspiracy theorist wants more fame and clout at the beginning of the movie. He has his own podcast that nobody listens to except for one guy that only listens to hate on him. Damn, I have more in common with this movie than I thought. Okay, later on he goes to Hollow Earth, discovers there are humans living there with their own culture and technology. Technology that he somehow manages to completely understand despite never seeing it before. With a chemical reaction, this liquid metal becomes an engineering mechanism, forcing the two electromagnetic pyramids together, causing an anti-gravity shockwave, but only for a few minutes or maybe less, which should keep those things from the portals. Wow, that was really just a guess? Well, we learned about it in physics. He is excited to reveal this information to the world, but is then warned by Diet Chris Pratt that revealing such information could lead to ruining their way of life. Feeling guilty over this possible future, he decides to do the right thing and delete the footage along with his chance of becoming more popular. Okay, how? How would revealing this information to the public impact their lives in any way? This isn't like f***ing El Dorado where revealing a city of gold will lead to a bunch of invaders. They live in a society where the only way to get to them is through Hollow Earth. A location, by the way, that is only accessible through a super expensive and complicated looking portal no one else besides Monarch has access to. And even then, you'd still need a super durable, super rare kind of ship that can withstand traversing through the portal, otherwise you'd be dead as soon as you dropped in. There was even a whole plot point about that in the last movie. The point I'm trying to make here is that even if people were made aware of their existence, they wouldn't be able to do shit about it. It would be like learning there's life on the sun. Okay, well, I can't go to the sun, so I guess I'm out of luck. But I'm not out of options. All in all, Conspiracy Theorist doesn't really change all that much by the end. Okay, what about AI-generated Steve Irwin over here? He is an eccentric hippie vet that specializes in kaiju. I also think he and the CEO girl boss mom had a thing of the past, but no longer because she probably realized he's the worst. And that's it. Wow, this guy seriously has nothing going on. Like me on a Friday night. The closest thing we get to development is between the CEO girl boss mom and the deaf girl. Which, in the beginning of the movie, the deaf girl feels like she doesn't fit in anywhere and the mom tells her as long as they're together, they still have a home. Fast forward to the end of the movie when the mom assumes that the deaf girl is going to stay with the Hollow Earth tribe as her new home, the daughter says, But mom, what do you mean? When I'm with you, I am home. These characters end the same way they started it. There's no growth, there's no lesson to be learned or revelation to be had. They are complete blank slates. The only thing going through your mind when they're on screen is, where are the monsters? Compare this to Godzilla Minus One. I already sort of explained the starting point for the main character, Koichi. Disgraced kamikaze pilot, guilt and shame for getting a bunch of mechanics killed, has a really bad case of the Mondays. <laughs> cowardice, etc. When he returns home, he starts a family with a woman that lost her parents in the war, as well as a baby she rescued. Slowly, Koichi starts to return to a normal life and forgive himself before things go bad. With his wife now dead, Koichi is filled with an absolute hatred for Godzilla and steals himself to throw his life away to try and kill it. In a way, Koichi finally turns into the soldier Japan expected him to become, willing to throw his life away just to hurt the enemy. At the climax of the movie, Koichi and his crew come up with a pretty convoluted plan to finish Godzilla off. Of course, something goes wrong and Godzilla does not die. Godzilla got pissed and began to attack, 
but didn't expect to be blocked by Shaq. Sorry. Koichi does one last kamikaze charge into its mouth, detonating a giant bomb and Godzilla's atomic breath at the same time from within his body, blowing up his head. There's a moment where we think Koichi is dead, but it's revealed that before the climax began, Tachibana had managed to create an ejector seat and told Koichi to use it to let go of his guilt and to choose life instead. Up until this point, Koichi has been pretty dead set on committing Sudoku because, you know, it's Monday. Both of these characters change their mindsets that they had at the start. Koichi let go of his guilt, treats people around him with kindness, and musters up the courage to put his life on the line, not for the country of Japan, but for the people of Japan. Tachibana has a similar journey. At first, you can see on his face that he judges Koichi for not going through with being a kamikaze pilot, and later blames him for getting all his men killed. When we find Tachibana later in the movie, he is a broken and bitter old man. It's only by seeing Koichi's resolve and his tragedies does he realize how important life is and rebuilds the ejector seat. There's a few more characters with similar journeys, but I think I've made my point. Minus One's characters aren't just there to push the plot along until Godzilla shows up again. They have their own arcs and growth to make. There's a reason for these characters to exist. They each have their own story to tell, and more importantly, that story is interesting. <laughs> Okay, is there anything Godzilla x Kong does better than Minus One? Yes, actually. The action. Reject humanity and return to monkey. This feels like such a shallow justification, but the main reason many people go see Godzilla movies is to see giant monsters beating each other outside of a waffle house. And this movie does that in spades. By the end of the movie, we have Godzilla and Kong versus Scar King and Ice Godzilla, I can't remember their name, in a super flashy 2v2. It's awesome! They fight in zero gravity and Kong fights with his new robot arm and Scar King fights with his fucking bone whip and Kong's axe. Meanwhile, Godzilla fights Ice Godzilla to the side, firing off laser beams and jumping around and tail whipping and Baby Kong tries his best. All in all, this stuff is just really, really fucking cool. Looking over at Minus One's action, since Godzilla is the only kaiju in the movie, you don't get big monster smackdowns. Instead, it's a bunch of people on boats or planes shooting machine guns at Godzilla to very little effect. The spectacle of cool stuff isn't as intense as Godzilla x Kong, even though the story is much better. This leads to a lot of feelings of hopelessness and almost pointlessness. You know that 99% of what they throw at him isn't going to do jack squat, so why even bother doing anything less than their ultimate weapon right away? That being said, the action is still pretty engaging. It's more about the tension of whether or not the humans will survive the encounter more than a battle between two equal forces. So I do like Minus One's action, but you can't compete with the new empire. I mean, Godzilla suplexes this motherfucker, and Kong bitch slaps three dudes with a baby monkey. Look at that. You know, it's pretty funny all the stuff I had said previously about characters and growth and themes and shit almost doesn't matter at all. I can still walk out of this movie thinking it was fun because the fights are so cool and that's the main reason I'm here. Yes, Minus One is a better movie in almost all respects, but they fulfill different roles for moviegoers. It reminds me of one of my all-time favorite tweets. It's technically about anime, but I think it applies here as well. Feel nothing but pity for people who think they're too smart for Meathead Shonen because they will die without ever experiencing the clarity of realizing that unlocking a new form to beat the bad guy while hype music plays is in fact the apex of all media. Nice nuanced character writing, you f***ing dipshit. Now check this out. <laughs> If Godzilla Minus One is a prime ribeye steak, then Godzilla X Kong is a cheap greasy cheeseburger with no nutritional value. And guess what? I f***ing love cheeseburgers.